I grew up in South Central Los Angeles. I did not come from an academic background. My parents were good people, and they took us to church. I didn't become a Christian until I was a freshman in college, however. And I was the last one in my family to become a Christian. Nobody before my generation went to college, and all of us in my, in my family, children, went to college. I went to college for one main reason. You have to take it by faith, but I was an athlete back then. <laughs> I played American football and wrestled and ran track. And, and it was athletics that took me to college. But having become a Christian, I was so excited about my faith in Christ, that God loved me, that he forgave me. I, I came to him knowing I longed to be loved unconditionally and knowing I had much to be forgiven. And that he would enter my life as Lord and start to bring order out of the chaos, it overwhelmed me. And I'm still so grateful. So I started sharing Christ with my friends. I made it a goal to share Christ with every guy I played football with in college every year I was in university. And we saw about 15 guys a year come to faith. Um, my friends, though, had questions. I did, hadn't asked questions, big questions, before I became a Christian. But my friends had questions like, if God's good and all-powerful, why does evil exist in the universe? I hate to confess it to you, but I had never asked that question before I became a Christian. But my friends asked it. And if that was a barrier for them, I didn't want to leave a stone unturned. And I would say to them, I don't know. I think it's a good question. I don't know the answer. I'm going to try and find the answer for you. And I would see a name come up in the literature. Maybe they would ask, why Christianity over other religions? Or how come Jesus says he's the only way? What about miracles? How come materialism isn't right? And so on. And Lewis's name kept cropping up. I went to have a dinner with my sister, an older sister, who was a, a, a teacher. She was teaching fifth grade. And she was reading to them, the, uh, the students, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. And she told me the plot of that book. I had never uh, heard of such a thing. And I went out and bought the Narnian Chronicles, and I read through them. I liked them so much that I wanted to find out more about Lewis. So I went and read his autobiography, Surprised by Joy, where he talks about how he moved from atheism to Christianity. He talked about being haunted by deep longings in his heart and the quest to find the object of those longings. I knew the longings, but I had never read anything whereby somebody gave me a vocabulary for my soul, like Lewis did. I think I could have read many other people, but I started reading Lewis voraciously at that time. <coughs> when I got ready to graduate from university, um, a wise man said to me, you do not get an education in college. All you do is lay a foundation for an education. In America, we call the graduation exercises commencement. And he said, that means that having laid the foundation, you are now to commence your education by building on that foundation. Pick an author who will take you places and make that author your life study. I, I, I don't think it has to be an author. It could be a composer. It could be an artist. It could be a period of history. It could be a country. But something that you will start to read and invest time in so that you will grow as a person and your world will be enlarged. And you will continue your education throughout the rest of your days, being enriched with a sense of wonder and awe at the beauty of our world, the interesting things in our world, even the questions and conundrums and difficulties in our world will be challenges for you to grow as you discover how we might think about these in a reasonable way. So I picked Lewis. I think I could have done worse. <laughs> I go to graduate school. And I did a master's in theology, and we had to write a thesis. And there was no way I was going to write a thesis on the use of the optative mood in the Greek text of Philemon. That would not hold me. But I wrote my thesis on C.S. Lewis. And consequently, I started putting pen to my reading now. And then I went on and did my doctorate on C.S. Lewis. I, I did it in the Open University in England, but my first supervisor was Basil Mitchell, at Oxford University, the philosopher. 
he had been the vice president of the Socratic Club when Lewis was the president. And when Lewis went on to Cambridge, Mitchell became the president of the Socratic Club. He was there for the Anscombe-Lewis debate. And also, he restaged it with Anscombe and with John Lucas, the Oxford philosopher. He used to meet with Lewis every week for lunch. And, and he was my supervisor through that area. Since that time, I, I have just, I don't know, I'm, I'm fascinated by Lewis, but not just Lewis. Lewis said in a, a preface to, uh, excuse me, in the personal heresy, you, you do not focus on an author when you read the author's material. You use the author as spectacles, looking through his eyes to see the wider world. Don't make a spectacle of the author. And Lewis is that way. As a matter of fact, if you're here to get Lewis, because you just want Lewis, um, I, I, I'm not going to do you much good. Because I want to see beyond Lewis the world that he looked at as we look at the big ideas. The, the other thing that's interesting, too, is as I was reading Lewis then, he became, for me, a liberal arts education. Because I wanted to read the books that he would refer to. You'll never get to the bottom of him. He did one book, English Literature in the 16th Century, Excluding Drama. He called it his Oh Hell volume. He did it for the Oxford History of English Literature. It took him 18 years from the time he signed the contract till the book came out. To write that book, he read every book written in English in the 16th century. He read every book translated into English in the original language it was written, Old French, Italian, Latin, and in translation, so he could compare the translation to the original with, with honest uh, scholarship. And that's just one book out of the 73 titles that bear his name. And, and, and so he opens more than wardrobe doors. You read him, you'll want to read Homer. You're going to want to read Plato and Aristotle. You're going to want to read the early church fathers. You will want to read <coughs> Athanasius. He wrote the introduction to uh, the incarnation of the word of God when a friend of his, Sister Penelope, did the translation. You're going to want to read Augustine and Boethius. He said in The Allegory of Love that the most influential book on medieval literature after the Bible was Boethius' The Consolation of Philosophy. He said a person wasn't considered educated up till 200 years ago if they didn't know that book well. I'd never heard of the book till I read about Lewis writing on it in The Discarded Image, his book on the medieval worldview. I went and got Boethius. I went to the bookstore. I said, you don't have to have Boethius, The Consolation of Philosophy. Yeah, it's right here on the shelf. Who's writing today that 1,500 years from now their books are going to be on the shelf? I read it. I'd say it's one of the 10 best books I ever read. Matter of fact, we have sometimes a problem, but with the idea of foreknowledge and free will. Boethius solves that problem in book five in a way that we say, why was I so stupid and didn't see the answer so clearly? Lewis gives a summary of that book for 16 pages in uh, the discarded image, and he has a two-page summary of Boethius's answer to that particular question. And by the way, um, you end up reading Lewis, and you'll want to read uh, Dante. And you'll want to read Chaucer, and you'll want to read Milton, and you'll want to read Shakespeare, and you'll want to read the, the uh, metaphysical poets, John Donne, George Herbert. You'll want to read uh, the near contemporaries of his, uh, George MacDonald, G.K. Chesterton, uh, Tolkien. Tolkien and Lewis were best of friends. They read their books to each other as they wrote them. As a matter of fact, that literary group called the Inklings, they wrote 365 books between them. It's amazing, the, the prodigious nature, not only of his work, but of his friendships as they encouraged each other. And so Lewis then opened up all these doors, and I would read all those books because I would want to know this background material. And, and it's just been a, a fascinating ride. I feel like a, a boy who, when he was little, saw a beetle on a back leaf in the garden and he saw the, the, the blue-green shade of the wings, and he saw the sun glistening on it, and he was fascinated, so he went to the library till he identified the species of beetle, and then started reading about its life cycles and its natural habitat and all the related species. And pretty soon he found out one day that everybody in the world wanted to know about his beetle. Well, I've lectured on Lewis now at, in 15 different countries, 71 universities, and, and Lewis is my beetle. And if nobody was interested in it, I'd still be all in. Because it has fed my soul, and it has opened my world, and I'm fascinated. 
I, I went to Belfast. I've lectured on Lewis many times in Belfast. And, and one time I went there and there was a woman who owned his boyhood home and she gave me two and a half hours to climb around there and look at the things he saw from his perspective. He could have watched the Titanic be built from his bedroom window. Um, I, I went to all the places where he fought in World War I. The places in Oxford, England. The places in Cambridge, England. Um, I've taught at the Kilns many, for many years, and then even went to Athens because I wanted to see where he and Joy went just before Joy died, to see that world from their perspective. It's all fascinating to me. So as I come, it's with this sort of background, not to have you be interested in Lewis, but to have you be interested in the wider world that God is offering to you to enjoy, and maybe Lewis could be your Virgil to guide you through your Dante experience as you pass through the infernos and purgatorios and paradisos of this life. And, 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 and in light of that too, maybe to make my point, I grew up very poor in South Central Los Angeles, a real rough part of Los Angeles. And I think I can make my case by telling you this story. Um, I would go to elementary school and I would see the children go to the cafeteria to buy lunch. It cost 31 cents. For us, that was prohibitive. That was way beyond what we could afford. My mother always gave me a lunch to go to school with, a sandwich, a piece of fruit, and a cookie. And, but I would watch those kids go to the, to the cafeteria, and I wondered, what was that experience like? One day, to my complete surprise, my mother, as I left the house, didn't hand me a bag for lunch. She handed me 31 cents. I put it in my pocket, nervous that I might lose it. I was always checking to make sure it was there. Lunchtime came, and I go into the cafeteria. And though I wouldn't have been able to describe it this way in third grade, these were my exact sentiments. Being unfamiliar with the sociological protocols of elementary school cafeteria life, I didn't want to do something stupid where everybody would make fun of me. So I watched with intensity the girl in front of me. I did exactly as she did. She paid the lady at the cash register her 31 cents. I did that and was relieved to have that burden lifted off of me. She grabbed her tray. She grabbed her knife, fork, and spoon, and her napkin. I did as she did. And she took that tray and put it in that chrome roll bar counter. Do you remember that thing? And then she comes to the first item, and it was string beans. I hate string beans. <laughs> And I was thinking this cafeteria life isn't cut out to be as much as I thought it was, but apparently the girl didn't like them either because she said to the cafeteria lady, do you remember that cafeteria lady? She was kind of heavy set. She had gray hair. She had her hair in a hairnet. She had a white outfit with a white uh, apron, and she worked in every elementary school cafeteria in the world. <laughs> you think Santa Claus gets around. This woman got around. So the girl said to her, I'll have a small portion of those, please. I'd never heard the word portion in my life. I watched as the cafeteria lady took a big spoon with holes in it so the juices could go through. She dug down into a big pot, took a little bowl, and gave her three string beans. I said, that's interesting. I'll have a small portion of those too, please. And she did the same for me. I said, this, world work, this word works some magic. But when I got to the end, I didn't know the extent of the magic it would work. Because I came to the end, and there, there, there were the most economically cut pieces of chocolate cake I'd ever seen in my life. And I wondered if it had other applications. And I said to the cafeteria lady, I'll have a large portion of that, please. <laughs> and she cut me the biggest piece of chocolate cake I'd ever seen in my life. And I thought to myself, that is a good word. <laughs> The psalmist said in Psalm 73, 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? And besides thee I desire nothing on earth. My heart and my flesh may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I want a large portion of him. Lewis has opened more than wardrobe doors for me. But everywhere where I read him, he keeps pointing upward. And he keeps pointing outward to places where I can discover God better. That's why I'm all in. It's not Lewis. It's more. We'll talk about that in a second. So let's look at three big ideas, maybe four, depending on if we have time. First big idea. Lewis was an objectivist. What I mean by that is he believed there was an objective world that existed independent of our thoughts about it. And there are knowers, subjects, who can think about that world. 
And Lewis believed that the subjective understanding of that world can be encouraged and, and, and so on if there's an objective reality that supports the claim. Or if there is no objective reality that supports the claim, it can be corrected if there's a false notion that we hold. He said to his students at Oxford University in a lecture called uh, On the English Syllabus, we have fulfilled our whole duty to you if we can help you see some given tract of reality. In other words, break you out of your subjectivism. Subjectivism is when we no longer take our clues from reality, but we're projecting on the world what we want it to be. Self-referential, and we begin to become utilitarian. So we want you to see some bit of reality. Let's look at this text, and let's study it not by projecting ourselves, but enlarging ourselves by discovering in that text a bigger world than we would have known before, to become somewhat objective in the way we look at life. He wrote a whole book about this called Experiment and Criticism. But this first lecture, this early lecture he gave in the 1930s, he's still following that idea when he does his literary critical work in Experiment and Criticism, comes out in 1960 or 61. So this idea then that there's a real world that's out there, and I need to try to understand that real world. Lewis also believed that that real world was infused with the very presence of God. Um, he says God walks everywhere incognito. Our responsibility is to awaken to him and even more to remain awake. Matter of fact, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, the poet, wrote something similar. She said, every bush is a burning bush and the world is crowded with God. Or this line, it's the last line in an essay called Is Theology Poetry by C.S. Lewis. It was the one that when they laid the, the stone, the memorial stone at Westminster Abbey at Poet's Corner, the stone closest to Chaucer's grave. Chaucer buried in Westminster Abbey was the, was the burial that started this Poet's Corner concept at Westminster Abbey. On that stone is this line from Lewis. I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun has risen. Not only because I see it, but because by it, I see everything else. This is a feature that allows me to have this integrated approach to faith and learning and life itself. And this was very important to Lewis. Um, I would like to play it out a little bit further, just to help us enter into the wonder of it all. There's a, a line, a, a paragraph actually, that Lewis wrote in the last book he wrote before he died, called Letters to Malcolm, Chiefly on Prayer. This is a book full of wonder. This is a book full of a man who knows he's on the threshold of heaven. There's anticipation of heaven. There's not fear to look at confusing things, but he's a guy who has a riveted faith in the God who he expects to meet soon. This paragraph comes from chapter 17 of that book, which I think is one of the best things he wrote. And before I recite the paragraph to you, I want to define a term. And I don't define the term to insult your intelligence. You probably already know the term. But I had no clue what it meant when I first read this years and years ago. And, and, and so I define it if you're here like I am, like I was then. The word is coruscation, coruscation. A coruscation is a sudden flash of brightness. So I, I grew up in Southern California. We didn't have fireflies there. Now I moved to the Midwest, to Chicago. Wheaton, Illinois, and they have fireflies. I love to see fireflies on a humid summer evening coruscating in the back garden. Or our weather usually comes from west to east, and we can look westward in dark, foreboding clouds coming our way, and you can see the lightning coruscating in the clouds. You got the idea of the word. OK, so now he makes a distinction between gratitude and adoration, or worship, wonder and awe. Gratitude exclaims very properly, how good of God to give me this. But adoration asks, what must that being be like whose far off and momentary coruscations are like this? One's mind runs back up the sunbeam to the sun. Everything we see in a world inhabited by God should be a call to worship. And so here it is, what must God be like? I read that. It was about 1979, 1980, something like that, when I read it for the first time. And, and it was right when Voyager, the interplanetary probe, was speeding past Saturn, that most mysterious planet in our solar system, the one with rings. 
I still have my, my National Geographic when they had those pictures published there up close and personal. You know what they discovered when they got that first close-up view of, of Saturn? The outer ring of Saturn, it's called the F ring, it's braided. It's braided. I'm asking Lewis's question. What must God be like that he chose to braid the outer ring of Saturn, even though no human eye had ever seen it before? I was amazed. I live in a world of academics. I have very close friends who are physicists. I say to them, why is it braided? I've heard five different explanations. Each one is a negation of the other four. <laughs> one of my really close friends, Robert Bishop, he used to teach physics at Oxford University. And he said to me, Jerry, these are the questions that keep us physicists up late into the night. I mentioned it to a firefighting friend of mine, a fireman that the outer ring of Saturn was braided. And he said, yeah, Jerry, we don't know if God didn't just braid it for the picture. I, I, I think of ships that park themselves over depths of the Pacific Ocean greater than the light of the sun can penetrate. And they dangle cameras into those depths and take pictures of fish, neon bright. Why? It can't be to attract a mate. Matter of fact, how do fish in those depths get together? That, that question itself is interesting in its own right, isn't it? <coughs> but I just think, wow, what must God be like that he chose to paint fish in the bowels of the ocean, neon bright? I grew up in Southern California, and I always like to see palm trees silhouetted against an auburn sunset sky, or a mountain range silhouetted against an auburn sunset sky. And then I moved to the Midwest, a cornfield silhouetted against an auburn sunset sky. We have no mountains, we have no palm trees, but there's beauty even in the sunset with a cornfield silhouetted, if you would willingly distill it out. Uh, we could have lived on a darkened planet. We could have gotten word from on high that there would be one sunset. We could have lined every west coast of every continent and every island on our globe, and we could have regaled our progeny by writing of that great event in our diaries, but what must God be like that he's made our planet a perpetual kaleidoscope of sunrises and sunsets? For, th for those of you that like, um, um, you know, installation art, where it's just gonna last a short period of time, God was the first installation artist. You, you, you see a bunch of people looking westward, you go, what are they looking at? And then all of a sudden you see it. The sky painted across a blue canvas with clouds that have been highlighted by the sun and they will be golden, apricot, salmon, orange, shrimp, even maybe a string of magenta running across it. And you look at it and your heart breaks as you begin to see it dissolve before your very eyes, don't worry, he's so liberal with these things. He'll give you another one on another day. One star twinkling in a night sky itself should be enough to awaken a sense of awe and wonder in the mind and heart of every right-thinking, right-feeling individual. But what must God be like that he has glittered the night sky with stars and moons and shooting stars, and galaxies, and planets. And I wish you could have been with me at Wheaton College's Northwoods campus, way up by Lake Superior. As one night when I was teaching up there, the students came knocking on my door at the cabin I was in, and then said, Jerry, they're out, they're out. And we came out and watched the northern lights. How many of you have seen them before? They were blues, and greens, and reds, and whites dancing, pulsating, and coruscating in the night sky. And you know what we did? The only thing that seemed just, because justice is to render to a thing its due, we stood on the ski dock that evening and lifted our hearts in songs of praise and adoration to the God who gave such glory. Wow. What must God be like that he made delicate things, like hummingbirds, flower petals, Peacock feathers, wow. If you've never gotten off on a peacock feather, you're missing it. But Lewis is too honest to let us stop there. He forces us to ask the hard questions too. What must God be like that there's earthquakes in Haiti, tsunamis in Japan, volcanoes in Hawaii, AIDS babies born in Africa, 
and too many school shootings in America. Lewis leans into the tough questions too, because he's not afraid. I think he's secure enough in the love of God. He's not afraid to look at the tough stuff. Matter of fact, he wrote the sermon he preached at Oxford University called The Weight of Glory. If our religion is objective, there we are again, if our religion is objective, then we must never avert our eyes from those elements in it which seem puzzling or repellent. For it's precisely in the puzzling or repellent where we discover what we do not yet know and need desperately to know. Um, this year I led nine mentoring groups at Wheaton College of students, eight that met weekly and one that met once a month. And these students, you know, they struggle with things. I take inspiration from Lewis. When I hear their struggles, I say, we don't have to run from those, and I don't want you to, apostasy, I, I don't want you to fall into apostasy and run away from God because there's some difficulty you face. So two of these groups, we spent six months, say, bring on your toughest questions. Look at the Bible, the hardest things you understand. Let's face these. Because throughout your life, you're going to see different ones. That's OK. Let's face the ones you see now. And if we can come up with a probable answer for it, it might not be the absolute answer, but if it's probable and it makes sense of all the data, then you don't have any, any reason to run from God because you saw the answer to the conundrum at some level. You can go deeper in your answers, and you can be wider in your application. But so let's look. And we were able to find those things. And I, I, you know, I've read through my Bible. I'm in my uh, 47th read through the whole thing. I've read the New Testament 31 times besides, <coughs> almost read through the whole Greek Testament at least twice. Every time I read it, I see stuff I don't understand. Every time I read it, I see stuff I didn't see before. Have you had that experience? I think it was testimony of the fact that it came from omniscience. We, don't, we never get to the bottom of it. But if I see something I don't understand, I just put it in a pending tray like a scientist might, some experiment they're waiting to work out. And I, another read or two through the Bible, I, I end up seeing what the answer is. I'm glad I didn't bail when I saw the problem, because now I've gone deeper. And I've understood a little bit better. And after a lifetime of doing this sort of thing, I think to myself, I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to run from the difficulties. Lewis gives me that. He wants me to look at reality, and he wants me to press into even the difficulties that I might find something revealed of God, even in that difficulty that was beyond my first imagination. So that's the big idea. He's an objectivist. He's looking at reality. He sees it as a reality infused with the presence of God. That is not the biggest idea in Lewis. The next idea I want to talk about is the biggest. <clears throat> that's a big one, but that's the stage for the second one. The second idea is reality is iconoclastic. Reality is iconoclastic. He writes about this in virtually every book he wrote, even his pre-Christian books. He uses the express uh, uh, phrase, reality is iconoclastic, in letters to Malcolm chiefly on prayer, and a grief observed, but he talks about the idea in all of his books. What does it mean? An iconoclast is a person who breaks idols. So I have an image of God. I read a Lewis book, read something in the Bible that made more sense to me than it made sense before. I heard a sermon. I came to ELF and heard a lecture or something like this. And some of the pieces of the puzzle for my understanding of God came together, and I had greater clarity in that moment. This image, very helpful, may take my breath away. It may temporarily give me a sense of awe. But if I hold on to that present understanding too tightly, it will compete against my having a growing understanding. So the image, once helpful, now becomes an idol. And C.S. Lewis wrote in Surprised by Joy, his autobiography, God is always kicking out the walls of any temples we build for him because he wants to give us more of himself. Reality is iconoclastic. Uh, because of this, uh, even the developmental theorists, people like uh, Piaget, who works with cognitive development, Eric Erickson with psychosocial development, Kohlberg and Gilligan working with moral development, all the developmental theorists will tell us that growth is always preceded by a moment of disequilibrium. As a matter of fact, um, um, uh, the book by Thomas Kuhn, The Structure of Scientific Revolution, says even scientific understanding is always preceded by a moment of disequilibrium. Um, reality is iconoclastic. My present thoughts come to me. I see the world in more of its complexity, and consequently, change is now <coughs> necessary. But what kind of change? 
Will it be a change of uh, kind? I scrap the present conceptual framework in order to embrace a new one? Or will it be a kind of change by degree? That what I believed was true and sure, but not complete. Everything you know, you can be confident in the truth you know. But that truth has still not been plumbed as deep as it could be plumbed. It still hasn't be under, been understood in all the applications by which I could understand it. So consequently, there's a change of degree. A tree doesn't have to give up its interior rings just because it adds more rings. But if it's not adding more rings, it's not growing. So there's an accommodation, excuse me, accommodation, scrapping the old idea for a new one, or assimilation, adding to the present understanding. Um, and I, I think this is helpful to you, many of you, if you like to do apologetic work and stuff like this, very helpful. I, I had a young woman in one of my C.S. Lewis classes, actually, at Wheaton College. Her name was Pharaoh Shannon, very, very bright young woman. And she came to me and she said, my best friend is going to visit me. She goes to Brown University. Brown University is an Ivy League school in America. It's one of our top universities. And she said, my best friend and I have been best friends since kindergarten, you know, first year of school. And she's an atheist, and she's studying at Brown. Her spring break is different than ours. She's coming to spend a week with me here. I'm going to bring her to class. Would you be willing to talk to her about spiritual things after class? I said, I'd be delighted. She comes to the class. They come up afterwards. I say, Pharaoh says, you've been friends since elementary school. Tell me about that. That's a wonderful thing. Not everybody has friendships that last that long. I said, she says, you go to Brown University. That's very impressive, an Ivy Leaguer. What are you studying there? She said, biochemistry. I said, wow, it's a challenging major. You're brighter than I first thought. <laughs> and I said, so we talked about spiritual things in this class. So, so uh, what would you think? She said, well, frankly, as a biochemist, which I thought was a little premature. She was only in her second year of university. <laughs> but she says, frankly, as a biochemist, I live on the principle that if I can't perceive it empirically, I just don't believe it. I said, that's the principle you live by? That if you can't perceive it empirically, you just don't believe it? She said, yeah. I said, would you please set that principle forth for me empirically? I hope you see the problem. It's a principle. It's not something empirically perceptible. She saw the conflict, and she freaked out. It was a moment of disequilibrium. Her reality was iconoclastic. She said, I can't believe it. Everybody at Brown University believes this. I said, no, there's Christians at Brown University. You'd be surprised they get everywhere. <laughs> Plus, I said, I've talked to materialists who wouldn't go that far. Let's just be fair to the materialists, even. And, 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 and she's freaking out. She said, I never saw this before. I never saw this before. I said, don't get me wrong. Um, I love the sciences. But do you guys, are you aware of uh, John Polkinghorn, who taught at Cambridge University? He was a physicist, and he also had a degree in theology, pastored a church while he was the president of one of the Cambridge University colleges. Um, he once said, if you ask the scientist, why is the kettle boiling? The scientist would say, heat from the burners agitating the molecules of the water and causing it to boil at 100 degrees centigrade at, at sea level. He says, that's a very good explanation for why the kettle's boiling, and it's the one that a scientist could give you because it's the measurable one. But you could also say, well, the kettle's boiling because I wanted a cup of tea, and would you like one also? And by mere scientific method, you could never give the second answer. And so I said this to this woman, telling her that account, and I said, don't get me wrong, I love the sciences. But, but, but Mortimer Adler, the philosopher at University of Chicago, said in four generations, We've gone from saying that which is measurable is that which is important for the sciences to saying that which is measurable is the only thing that's important. And it's at a loss of our humanity. And I said, you're at a university, and you have four divisions in the university. You have the sciences, and I love what the sciences do for us, and I love the way the engineers apply it and make our life better. But you also have the social sciences that are trying to understand demography, study what's going on in the thoughts of the people. You can't draw morality from that because people's thoughts are constantly, cultures are constantly in change. But still, it's good to know the world in which we live and find ourselves, the values that people are holding. Third, you have the humanities. And the humanities give us a wide swath of literature that record for us the history of our world. 
They record for us the philosophy of our world and the literature of our world. And we could see things that will percolate in a moment in history that fire up like 4th of July fireworks in the United States. And then they die out and you never hear much about them again. And there are other things that are perennially coming up generation after generation because they speak of the great human struggle. And we can gain the accumulative wisdom of how people have learned from these things. And then lastly, you have the fine arts. The fact that humans, as Tolkien said, are sub-creators made in the image of a creator. And so they engage in music and the arts and literature and so on. And I said, these are the humanities. These are the things that teach us what it is to be human. I said, we want it all. We don't want just the merely measurable. She came back the next year, this young woman. I said, hey, how are you? It's good to see you again. She says, I'm an agnostic now. That's progress. She had moved from atheism <laughs> to agnosticism. But, but the deal is, reality is iconoclastic. So Lewis isn't the only one who has this idea. He's drawing on a rich swath of literature where this is constantly percolating. An, an author I got to through him was Baron von Hugel. He was a philosopher of religion. And Baron von Hugel, in his letters of spiritual direction to his niece, Gwendolyn Green, he said to her, beware of the first clarity. Press on to the second clarity and the third clarity. That's reality as iconoclastic. Robert Browning, the poet. Uh, matter of fact, if you're taking notes, write down the title of this poem, Rabbi Ben Ezra. Rabbi Ben Ezra. I read this poem every year to my wife on our anniversary. It's the one that begins, grow old along with me. The best is yet to be. But about line 30 in that poem is a reality as iconoclastic <coughs> turn of the phrase. It says, then welcome each rebuff that turns Earth's smoothness rough. We can think we have it all figured out. Everything's nice and smooth. Everything's in its perfect place. Our system's working for us. Welcome the rebuff that helps you to see it the way that it is rather than the way you have to have it be. It's got peaks. It's got valleys. It's got texture. Reality's iconoclastic. Tennyson, the poet, in his poem, In Memoriam, that he wrote over 15 years after the be his best friend's <coughs> death, working out his grief, he wrote of theological systems. Our little systems have their day, they have their day and cease to be. They are but broken lights of thee, and thou, O Lord, art more than they. One of, dear friend of mine, Walter Elwell, who was a, a philosopher, I mean, excuse me, a theologian, he used to say, Theology is just approximation, and what we seek are better and better approximations. Or as Lewis put it, I want God, not my idea of God. We could extend it, I want my spouse, not my idea of my spouse. I want my neighbor, not my idea of my neighbor. I want myself, not my idea of myself. Or we could go on to um, Augustine. In the Confessions, at the beginning of that work, that great work, Augustine said, the house of my soul is too small. Enlarge it, Lord, that you might enter in. Reality is iconoclastic. Or how about in the Bible? Stephen, Acts chapter 7. His defense before those people holding rocks who want to stone him to death. He's on trial for speaking against the temple up on the mound. And Stephen basically says, you think you've got God in that box up there on the hill? Don't you know that he's bigger than that box? Matter of fact, when God first appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia, that was hundreds and hundreds of miles from where that box is. When Joseph went to Egypt, he wasn't alone. God didn't abandon him. He went with him there. When Moses was taking care of his father-in-law Jethro's sheep in the Midian wilderness, God was there. He even appeared to him in a burning bush. Matter of fact, when David wanted to build that box, God said, David, I appreciate the sentiments, but don't you know? Heaven is my throne. Earth is just my little footstool. How will you build a box big enough to contain me? Reality is iconoclastic. And for those of you who love Lewis, who's the most spiritually sensitive person from our world to go into Narnia? Hands down, nobody compares. Who is it? Lucy. Lucy. And she goes into Narnia after experiencing in a relationship with Aslan, burying her face in his mane, Aslan the lion, the Christ figure of those books. She goes back to Narnia 
for her second time in Prince Caspian. And she sees him for the first time, and she exclaims, Aslan, you're bigger. He said, oh, no, child, I am not. But every year you grow, you will find me bigger. Wow. Wow. Reality is iconoclastic. Don't be afraid if your present conceptual framework is challenged. Be concerned if it's not. There's a sense, I think, where all of us are, are not very life-skilled. Nobody's ever ready to get married. If you waited till you were, you'd miss out on all those joys. Nobody's ever ready to have children. If you waited till you were ready to have children, the whole human race would end this generation. We function with awkwardness, right? You, you, a toddler learning to walk falls down and gets bruised. Five-year-old taking the training wheels off the two-wheel bike falls down and gets abrasions. An adolescent picking up a skateboard, trying to ollie or take on a half pipe, sprains an ankle or breaks a wrist. Remember when you were in that one-room school experience in elementary school, and then you went to middle school where you had to go to six different classrooms? Remember how awkward that was? Remember when you left school and you had to make a living for yourself and how awkward that first work experience was? I want to suggest to you, if you're not awkward someplace in your life, you're just not growing. <laughs> Don't be afraid of it. Reality is iconoclastic. And what's on the other side? You get to prune the stuff that's false, and you get to see in new light and new measure the wonders that God has for us. G.K. Chesterton, you should get to him if you read Lewis eventually. In his one uh, uh, essay, Tremendous Trifles, he ends it with these words. The world will never starve for want of wonders, but only for want of wonder. And the person who tightens up their world and doesn't see reality as iconoclastic, they lose. I don't know how much time we have, but I want to be conscientious of it. 20 minutes, so let me give you another big idea. <coughs> Lewis was haunted by these longings. You read Lewis and you read about the longings. He calls it different things. He calls it sweet desire. He calls it joy. He uses a German word, Sehnsucht, to speak of it. Um, sometimes he refers to it as nostalgia. But it's a longing that if we are objective and we read our hearts right, we know that sometimes we just sort of don't fit. Um, he, he, he writes about them in uh, the first book he writes as a Christian. Uh, it's called The Pilgrim's Regress, an allegorical apology for Christianity, reason, and romance. It's always good for the apologist to realize Lewis always used story as one of the tools in his rhetorical toolbox. And this guy named John, who's one of the main characters, by the way, it's the only allegory Lewis writes. The Narnian books aren't allegories. But in this particular book, John, the main character, sees an island off in the distance, and it sets him on a pilgrimage and a quest. And he's trying to find this island. He's, he, it's awakened in him desire. Um, he has to go on his route. And if he goes towards the mountains, towards the north, it's jagged and it's rough. And this is the realm of reason. If he goes to the south, he ends up in the swamps. And this is the realm of the romantic longings of the heart. <coughs> and somehow he has to find the place that gives him balance between head and heart. In his book, The Arthurian Torso, Lewis said the first problem in life is how do you fit the head and the heart? He refers to it from the poem by Wordsworth, The uh, Prelude, where, where Wordsworth, talks, Wordsworth talks about a, a Bedouin shepherd who's walking with a stone and a shell. And he's trying to fit the stone and the shell, reason and romance, the longings of the heart. Williams uses the image in his book, uh, the Arthur, uh, uh, his Arthurian poetry, and Lewis writing literary criticism of that poetry brings us together. How do you fit the stone in the shell? How do you have the romantic longings of the heart and, and good reason bring them together? He believes that Christianity is the thing that brings them together best. But Christianity is a religion of, of reconciliation. Sin divides us, separates us from God, estranges us, estranges us from one another, even estranges us from ourselves. We have battle between head and heart, battle between uh, our immaterial parts and our material parts, our, our soul and our flesh. God wants to reconcile us. He wants to make us whole. He wants to make us like the Lord Jesus. And so John, as he's on his quest and he drifts off into the swamps or he gets off into rigidity and, 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 and dogmatism, and, and he needs to find the balance. And eventually along his way, he comes to this, this one character, History, who's a hermit. 
Hermit represents history. And he asks him about the longings. And the hermit says, well, there's been three expressions of this longing. If there's three, there could be 303. But he just, Lewis has time for this book, only three, right? And, and he, he situates them. So the first one is uh, the longing for myth, the longing for myth or story. It's kind of the pilgrim longing. And he situates it in classical times, Homer, uh, the Greek playwrights, and so on. And then uh, uh, Virgil, the Aeneid, and so on. And then, then the second longing is the longing, he says, for the lady. And he situates this in the medieval literature, particularly we could see it in Dante, we could see it in, in um, Guillaume de Lory's Romance of the Rose, and these sorts of things, the longing for the lady. Third is the longing that's awakened by nature, and we see that in the Romantic poets, the, the late um, uh, 1700, early 1800 German Romantic poets, and also the poets in England, uh, uh, Shelley, Byron, Keats, Wordsworth, Coleridge, and so on. So what's Lewis saying about this? Well, I, I would have to say, let's go, let's go through them all. So let's start with, uh, with uh, Virgil's Aeneid. Aeneas is in Troy. Uh, Troy is being sacked by the Greeks when they bring in the Trojan horse and they open up the gates and all the Greek soldiers have come. And, 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 and Aeneas wants to fight against them. But he sees the ghost of Hector and he sees the ghost of his wife and they say, flee the city. It's lost. Take as many as you can with you and build the new city. And the city that he's going to build is Rome, and Virgil was trying to give the Romans a myth, a story by which they could begin to understand their own identity. And so here is Aeneas, who's between the two cities, the city of his birth and the city that will one day be. He has a nostalgic tug for the city of his past, and he has a longing for the city that's before him. It's a little bit like Abraham in Hebrews 11. He left Ur of the Chaldees because he was looking for the city that has foundations. He's architect and builder as God. And in this particular thing, um, uh, we see uh, Augustine, for example, didn't like the old myths, the classical myths. He loved this one because he thought it was almost analogous to what's going on in every human heart. We long for the place of our birth. We long for the place that we will be. You can have experiences of this. I, I don't know what your experience is, but I have my 50th high school reunion coming up next September. I'm going to go. Whenever I go back to reunions, it's a similar situation. I see the old lots where we used to play games. They have buildings built on them now. I see the buildings that were so familiar, they've been knocked down and new buildings have been put in their place. I go to the reunion itself, and, and I'm longing to go home. They give you a name tag when you go to the reunion, when you're my age, with your yearbook picture on it, because nobody would recognize you otherwise. <laughs> my old friends, the guys, they're all bald, <laughs> gray beards, thick glasses, got a paunch, you know. I'm fine, but life's been hard on them. <laughs> you go back and it's not the same, and yet we're looking for something, something that's the same. Lewis says in this idea of myth that it's the mark of a literary person that they read books more than once. Now, some books aren't worth reading even once, I think. And if you come to Wheaton College, we have Lewis's library there, and you can pull out Don Juan by Lord Byron and look at the last page, and he wrote on it the date he finished it and wrote right underneath it, never again. <laughs> so Lewis thought that one wasn't worth reading more than once. But what does he mean, the literary read books more than once? There's some books that awaken such longing in the hearts of the literary that they go back to those books periodically. Lewis used to read The Fairy Queen about every other year. He would read uh, Virgil's Aeneid with great frequency. What's it about? It's like a child when they hear a good story at bedtime. What does the child say at the end of the story? Read it again. And Lewis says, why is that? And he says, because in the story, we heard something about another world, and we wanted to go back to that world. And he says it awakens in us a longing for the only other world we could ever really know, which is heaven. You can get it also in a well-crafted argument. It's so elegant. There's some beauty to the balance of it and the symmetry and so on. And consequently, we go back to that too because we're thrilled by the well-crafted argument. 
So there's the myth longing. Then there's the, the lover longing or the lady longing. Um, Lewis refers to Dante particularly. What was it about, what about Dante? Dante meets this woman named Beatrice. He writes about it in his first book, The Vita Nuova. He meets her on the streets of Florence by the Ponte Vecchio, over the bridge over the Arno. And, and, and he sees her, and she awakens in him longing for something. But what is it? Is it Beatrice? He only sees her maybe about 12 times in his life. Although they lived, if you've been to Florence, they only lived probably about, um, I don't know, a third of a mile from each other. But something's awakened in him, and he's trying to figure it out. By the time he writes the Divine Comedy, he thinks he's got a pretty good grasp of it. See, in the Divine Comedy, it is Virgil who represented to him the highest of literary art because he captured the concept of longing. Virgil leads Dante through the Inferno, leads him partway through the Purgatorio. Beatrice, who's died, comes out of heaven and collects him and leads him the rest of the way through the Purgatorio on into the Paradiso, heaven. And, and there's a lot of adventures going on. I don't want to short circuit it, but this is the thread that runs through the whole thing. And when Beatrice gets to the very threshold of the vision of God, Dante writes, she turned to look, but not at me. She turned to the eternal fountain. And Dante's saying any proper understanding of relationship should awaken in us the archetypal relationship, hunger for the archetypal relationship, the very God who exists in Trinity, who exists in relationship and made us as relational beings. It should awaken in us longing for him. When C.S. Lewis's wife died, A Grief Observed was the book he wrote. You know what the last lines are in A Grief Observed? They're in Italian. And they are, she turned to look, but not at me. She turned to the eternal fountain. God knew the concept. All proper understanding of relationship should lead us to the archetypal relationship. And then, and then also, um, we could put it this way, have you ever felt lonely before? What does it tell you about your nature? Uh, it tells you you're a sociological being. You need others. The fact that you can communicate tells you you were made for community. But have you ever felt lonely in a crowd? Or lonely under the same roof with people you care for and you know they care for you? Well, it doesn't prove anything. Might it not strongly suggest that you've been made for, for more than just mere human relationship. That God is wooing us through whole things that are relational. And then the third one is the longing that's awakened by nature. He uses Wordsworth as his example. Wordsworth, as he got older, saw that he was getting jaded, calloused. Remember that romantic writers were writing at the beginnings of the Industrial Age. People were leaving the farms. They were coming to the cities. The cities were creating their own kinds of pollution and their own kinds of social problems. Uh, we're awkward every new phase of life and every new cultural change. There's an awkwardness. But, but what Wordsworth noticed was that in his own life as he got older, he was becoming more calloused and more jaded. He longed for the lost innocence of his youth. The romantic poets are writing almost nostalgically of the times in nature where things seem to be unspoiled and so on. And it's this awareness of our human brokenness that drives us to the hope that maybe we could be fixed someplace. Maybe we can encounter the love of God, the forgiveness of God, the grace of God, Maybe even the communities that are also broken, even our Christian communities that are broken. But we gather together that we might um, help one another to grow and mature and begin to understand how to do life better. Well, there's more we could give you. Um, if you want more on this idea of joy or nostalgia or longing, Lewis says we're tempted by it to tether the longing to the wrong object. We go through what he calls the dialectic of desire. Tether it to it, we're disappointed. We untether, tether to this, we're disappointed. Untether, tether to this. He says in mere Christianity, if I find in myself a desire that nothing in this earth satisfies, it doesn't mean the earth's a fraud. It means maybe the earth was meant to awaken the desire and to point us ultimately to God. I think this is really important. Um, there's more we could say about this desire. It's a huge idea in Lewis. Reality is iconoclastic is the biggest, but these other two, reality and the longings, are probably second in like unto it.